People look at me like I'm utterly crazy when I tell them that honey has benefits for insulin resistance. It's hard to grasp at first, but we also need to look at two really important things. Number one, I'm not asking you to consume a lot of honey. We're talking maybe at most a tablespoon, but realistically more like a teaspoon or two. Secondly, it's not about the macronutrient profile of honey, more so about the actual quality of the honey and what's in the honey. And we've talked about this in other videos where we compare table sugar to honey, and it's totally different even when the sucrose content is about the same. So regular sugar and honey are wildly different because of what's in honey. But I wanna double down on this whole insulin resistance topic because when you look at insulin resistance, it's so easy surface level to think that it's simply about your blood glucose. Your blood sugar is like a secondary, like almost casualty of insulin resistance, okay? There's more stuff going on at an inflammatory level, at a cellular, metabolic, mitochondrial like dysregulation level, and the blood sugar is just a secondary casualty of that because the metabolomics, the, the overall impact of insulin on a cell, et cetera, et cetera, is making it so that sugar doesn't get absorbed and then goes high. So that is the symptom, not the actual problem. However, once the problem exists, adding sugar on top of it definitely can make it worse because you're basically adding fuel to a fire. Where does honey come into the equation? Honey has flavonoids, and we're seeing now the evidence being quite strong that flavonoids have a potent effect on inflammation within the body. There's a couple of things we wanna talk about. One, there's the impact on the gut and how it can impact inflammation there. I've got some evidence that I'm happy to share there, but basically we've seen, if you look at the diagram that's on the screen right now, you can actually see this was published in Frontiers in Nutrition. We saw that when honey was in the equation, the prebiotic nature of honey in and of itself directly decreased inflammatory cytokines and increased anti-inflammatory cytokines in the gut itself because of the specific flavonoids and the indigestible components of honey. So it's not just the sugar there. The sugar gets absorbed and then the rest starts to do its interesting things. This can have a huge impact there. FYI, I also put a link down below for seed, which is what's called a symbiotic, a prebiotic and a probiotic in one single capsule. So you look at it, it's like a capsule inside of a capsule. This is a great thing to use in conjunction with honey because it can help sort of take those probiotics that are in this actual capsule and the honey can help sort of make it all work synergistically a little bit. You don't have to take them together, but it's sort of a wham bam, like one, two punch for the gut. So that link is a 25% off discount link for Seeds Daily Symbiotic. Again, if you're trying to make a shift to like your eating patterns or things like that, it's probably one of the biggest levers that you could pull. Changing your, or altering your microbiome and having a shift happen as rapidly as you can, that's gonna elicit a pretty profound change in how you feel and potentially look, and the list goes on. So anyway, that link is down below for Seeds Daily Symbiotic. It's a 25% off link. But more than just the gut piece, what about the direct piece? Here's what we have to look at. If you look at different kinds of honey, it's funny because you have a wide variety of different glycemic index scales or different glycemic indexes of these honeys. Uh, here's an interesting example. Like more, Most commonly, we see like wildflower honey. Wildflower honey is like a, 55 to 75 GI. That's a high glycemic carbohydrate, right? That's something that most people would say, like that's sweeter than table sugar. Like maybe we shouldn't have that. Okay, but here's what's interesting. Then you look at something like acacia honey. It's between a 30 and a 35. It's half of wildflower honey. And then you look at something like Manuka honey, which is widely known as probably the most beneficial concentrated antioxidant, like good for you honey. And that one's like 55 to 60, so it's pretty high up. But acacia honey doesn't have a whole lot of antioxidants compared to Manuka, but it's lower glycemic. The glycemic scale is only telling you with honey the ratio of glucose to fructose. And remember, we know that in high amounts, excess fructose could be problematic too. So if it's a lower GI, that means it's gonna be higher fructose, lower glucose. So you could make an argument one way or the other, right? Okay, if it's low GI, then it's high fructose, and that's potentially bad. If it's high GI, then it's high GI, and that's potentially bad. 
You see how we're kind of in a pickle here? We're backed into a corner, so what is it? It's neither of those, unless you're having tons of it. At a small scale, it comes down to the antioxidant effect. How much antioxidants is in that honey? How many phenolic compounds? How many flavonoids? That's what we need to be looking at honey for, not the simple sugar aspect of it. And look at, I know Paul Saladino, he's a good friend, candidly. And I know he talks about the benefits of honey from an insulin perspective, but that's just what he's talking about. That's what he's loud about. He knows that there's benefits to honey from the food matrix. I, I'm a little more of a mechanistic guy, candidly, so I like to talk about, okay, yes, sure, there's an insulin spike that could be beneficial, but what about in people that are maybe metabolically damaged? Well, then we still need to look at maybe lesser quantities and look at the overall impact of the antioxidants and the flavonoids that are in honey, because that's powerful too. But don't take my word for it, let's look at some science. So remember how I mentioned that at first glance, acacia honey would be best because it's low glycemic. Okay, short term, yes, but we're in this long term. And remember what I talked about at the very beginning, inflammatory responses matter the most, in my opinion. The inflammation is going to be a potentially larger, I could probably get away without even saying the word potentially as the safeguard there. It probably is the bigger situation. If you can modulate the inflammation, then the signal from insulin to a cell is going to be better. So we look at a study in diabetologia. This was a rodent model study, full disclaimer, but it was easy to control in this case. They looked at the impact of flavonoids and antioxidants after carb consumption, and they found that when antioxidants were added into the equation, it delayed the postprandial glucose effect significantly, even more so than if they were just consuming a low glycemic carb. So antioxidants actually delayed the postprandial glucose effect. It delayed the rise in glucose more than actually just eating something with lower GI. What? Simply by having antioxidants. The antioxidants increased insulin sensitivity. So even though it was a higher glycemic carb, the fact that there was more insulin sensitivity meant that the insulin was able to do its job and the carbs were able to get where they needed to go. Long term, and short term really, long term this is going to be significantly better from an insulin resistance perspective because you're actually getting to more of a root situation here. Make no mistake, exercising and proper diet are key, absolutely critical, the most important thing. But there's effects of honey that people are overlooking simply because it has some carbs in it. And then when you factor in obesity into the equation, you find that obesity, when they looked at uh, mice with obesity, the antioxidants in honey had a completely different effect or an enhanced effect. They actually found that honey, quote unquote, fought against genetic changes when it came down to insulin resistance and insulin sensitivity. So basically, it was protective. So having something like Manuka honey or even Gelum honey or something that is going to be a higher sort of MGO content, higher antioxidant, higher flavonoid content could be the difference between chugging along, trying to control your diet as best you can and having a little something in there that gives you something sweet that maybe helps your brain feel better, but also gives you a benefit independent of just regular nutrition and carbs, right? I'm gonna save the fat loss stuff for another video because that stuff in and of itself gets to be quite intense, okay? But what we are seeing here is that you can't miss the forest for the trees simply because something has a few grams of carbohydrates. If you're talking a teaspoon of honey, you're talking a massive dose of antioxidants, but you're talking less than 10 grams of carbohydrates. If you have this post-workout or even intra-workout, you're not even going to need much insulin to deal with that in the first place. And here's a little hot tip. There's something called the insulin-independent glucose uptake, which means if you're active and you consume that honey while you're active, there's very little if no insulin required to even shuttle that glucose into the cell because there's sort of a mechanical leverage that occurs that allows the GLUT4 translocation to bring the glucose in without insulin being required because the muscle's in movement. So if you're concerned about the glucose and the insulin spike, there's a simple answer. Consume a little bit of honey while you are actually working out. As always, keep it locked in here on my channel. I'll see you tomorrow.